one of the things that I was curious about was that there seems to be this interesting theme of physicists exposing probability theory as essential. And so you have a lineage of people, right? Going back to Laplace, right? Moving forward, you have Jane's, you have Jeffrey's, right? You have all these people doing all this interesting scientific work. And you look at Jane's deciding to write his book, which he didn't finish in his lifetime, but really taking on the cause in a way that seems a little out of the bounds of, you know, work that they were actually doing in their fields. And I wonder if that is something that you can explain a little bit further. I think I can. Great. I believe that working scientists are perhaps the people who are in the best position to uh, develop statistical methods because when all said and done, they are there for use. They're not an end in itself. And if you have a department of statistics, it's liable to become an end in itself and a branch of pure mathematics, which statistics really isn't. It's for use. And as it's a mathematical technique, it's for use in the mathematical sciences. That's why mathematical scientists have been the ones who've historically made the best innovations in it. And did you have any sense of why Jaynes didn't finish his book in his lifetime? Ah, uh, I partly ill health foreclosed on him and partly he was a perfectionist and not a particularly quick writer. And so Brett Horse takes it on as the mentee, sort of, so to speak, but he still gives him a really beautiful tribute in his way of saying, I'm not going to change these things and that there are things in here from notes or whatnot that I don't completely know what he meant by and I'm going to try and leave them in some purity because you know, the master is always the master and the student in that case didn't feel he had come to the, risen to the occasion. Larry did a very difficult job very well of editing that book. He had to decide what to put in and what not to put in, in the parts where it was borderline. And I can remember from papers that were rattling round long before it was published, what it looked like. And I think uh, Larry did a very sensitive job. And what was their relationship like? Larry was Ed's research student, simple as that. And one of, obviously one of Ed's better research students because he continued to work under Ed with a postdoc. Many of Ed's research students simply moved on. And then they stayed friends and he's now the executor, right? I don't know about executor, but uh, certainly Larry was charged with finishing the book. And then if you can talk a little bit about inductive theory being similar to probability theory, elaborate on that. Well, if you look at the, what philosophers call inductive logic, it's essentially about what to do when you've not got enough information for certainty in a particular case. The famous example, which I think is at least 200 years old, is what grounds do we have for believing that the sun will rise tomorrow? Merely because uh, it's arisen for, uh, well, thousands of uh, millions of days in the past. And we scientists aim to try and get a scientific theory that will explain that. But without a scientific theory, there really aren't any grounds other than pattern recognition for why it will uh, rise tomorrow. And therefore, if you've got a theory, you need to test that theory in the light of the data. And testing theories and comparing them against each other is to do with probability theory. It's an example of what's called hypothesis testing, which is understood to be uh, something that goes on and in which probability theory is deployed. And so if we think about that in terms of sort of Bayesian work and the notion of looking at the data versus looking at the hypothesis. It seems to us that that's a big break that we're in right now, where people are still looking at the data and they're not actually even testing the hypothesis, they're testing something in the data. Do you see that as a sort of exposure of how things have gone wrong in the areas of science that are broken? Let me call the areas that you're talking about uh, sampling theory. I think that's uh, a good name for <coughs> where ways to invert the relationship between the hypothesis and the data are done badly by uh, orthodox statisticians. Bayes does it right 
But the orthodox statisticians, for a generation at least, didn't like that because uh, they said it's subjective. It involves bringing in prior information from outside the experiment about the hypothesis. I say that it's healthy to bring in prior information about the hypothesis. And pretty logical, right? They're Absolutely. Harder to avoid. And For then... example, if you are ordered to do an experiment to measure something by your boss, but you happen to know exactly what the answer is, which a mathematical physicist would call a delta function, then no matter what the data say, you are always going to stick to what you are certain with beforehand probability one, and you're going to assign all deviations from that to noise. And therefore, you do want prior information. In the, ca the case where your prior information corresponds to certainty and the experiment is irrelevant, that's enough to knock down all the sampling theoretical methods. That's why you do want prior information. Now, most of the sampling theoretical methods are ad hoc. They're invented by, I should say in fairness, statisticians with very good insight to try and work out what hypothesis was true or estimate certain parameters in specific problems. And generally those methods work quite well in the problems that they are invented for. That's a testament to the uh, mathematical insight of people like R. A. Fisher who did that in genetics for example. But Bayes' theorem will always outperform them. It'll outperform them slightly in uh, areas where they work well, but it'll outperform them massively in areas where they work badly and you need to invert the relationship between the data and the hypothesis. So then in your assessment, why has frequentist seemed to be the popular method? I mean, it does seem like if you look at the insurance industry or you look at trying to find a submarine or you look at all of these things when like, you know, the shit hits the fan, for lack of a better way of saying it. People use Bayes, right? The insurance industry essentially can get away with being frequentist because they've got such an enormous data set that it doesn't make much difference. But I think they're actually Bayesian. I mean, I think they're using lots of prior information about people to make predictions about the outcomes that they're going to get and therefore charging different scaled rates, right? If you've gotten in lots of accidents or been arrested for drunk driving, your rates are going to be higher because the likelihood of you getting in trouble again is greater than somebody with a clean record, right? Okay, they're, but they're, they've still got such an enormous data set that they're, they can extract, that the, the probabilities are the same as the relative frequencies, the proportions, and therefore you don't need to worry about the difference between Bayesian and non-Bayesian methods in that case. In hunting submarines, and uh, I think you're talking about the example of the scorpion and L.D. Stone's book, they were Bayesian. Right, well that's what I'm saying. I was saying like when you really need to get down to solving a problem, it seems to me that people go to Bayes. They, even if they were frequentists in the past, they surrender and they go to it. But there's a shying away from Bayes that's a little illogical to me, coming at this with fresh eyes and not really knowing why it's so entrenched. Believe me, the shying away from Bayes is a lot less bad now than it was when I was young. Bayesian methods, I think, are starting to be uh, more recognised, and there's now a Wikipedia page on Cox's theorem, which there wasn't. What do you, how do you account for that? Like, how do you account for the notion that people were anti-Bayes? It started when and I have to say, unfortunately, it started in Cambridge, when one or two people decided that probability uh, and proportion were the same thing, not just that they might be numerically uh, equal, but the same thing, and that's called the frequency interpretation of probability. And that became popular in the 19th century. And all of the anti-Bayesian stuff essentially came out of that. It's a bandwagon that started almost from nothing after Laplace and before him Bayes himself had given the subject the best possible start. And after that, the, uh, the frequency interpretation came in and it's a bandwagon that just grew perhaps at random, but it's not the best way to do things. It's and interesting. It's very hard to uh, stop a bandwagon that's got a lot of momentum because a lot of people have got their careers tied up in it. And similarly with falsification as a means of defining what science is. 
you'd really need to talk to a philosopher of science like Jim Moore about that. <laughs> well, so one of the things that you wrote was about how when you met David Stove, you were skeptical of philosophy. And he sort of changed your mind about that, or that led to great conversations between the two of you. I think it's fair to say that I've never been interested in philosophy, and I was skeptical of philosophy of science, i.e. Popper, and the people who followed Popper. Mm -hmm. And David explained to me exactly why I was right to be skeptical, which I couldn't have put into words before. And when I put that together with uh, my own understanding of Bayesian probability, I reached an understanding of the philosophy of science that I found satisfied me completely. So from your perspective, what's wrong with falsification? You can never know for sure that uh, a theory is wrong and it might be resurrected in the light of future data. Now, I don't believe that's going to happen to non-relativistic Newtonian physics compared to Einstein's. Uh, I don't know if someone's going to come out with something even better than Einstein in the future, but uh, that's the way that science advances. Is inductive? Yes, it's very definitely inductive. Also, there's the fact that falsification puts excessive uh, emphasis on a, a theory being having the capability of being wrong. But what scientists want to do, the dream of a scientist is to come out with a theory which is provisionally right, not wrong. You do not find a scientist saying, I want to come up with a theory that's wrong. That's crazy. And won't get published. <laughs> Some do. <laughs> it is worth publishing negative results to stop other people going down a blind alley, but uh, that's something different. And can you tell me a little bit about who Jane's biggest influences were? Ed Jane's, he was drafted in the war, and I think he finished off as a lieutenant, was it? He then went straight into theoretical physics. Uh, he was privileged to be lectured to and was interested in working under J. Robert Oppenheimer, the man who led the physics side of the A-bomb project at Los Alamos during the war. But Ed, Ed Jaynes had a different view of uh, quantum theory from uh, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was a well-rounded personality and he liked reading mystical poetry. But to Ed's view, and in fact I agree with Ed on this, Oppenheimer enjoyed the mysticism in quantum mechanics of the fact that in some circumstances you can't predict what's going to happen with certainty in quantum mechanics, only with probability. Ed took the view that uh, in that case you should carry on and get a better theory, not disparaging quantum theory at all. It was an improvement on what went before, but don't stop there, keep going. That's the view that uh, Schrodinger took, that's the view that Einstein took, it's opposite to the view that Niels Bohr took, it's opposite to the view that Werner Heisenberg took, and it's opposite to the view that uh, Oppenheimer took. So Ed Jaynes in the end didn't do his doctorate under Oppenheimer, he did it under Eugene Wigner, who was uh, a Hungarian Jewish refugee and wonderful physicist and mathematician who'd come to the USA. That was at Princeton. And it's worth adding that uh, Ed was not above name-dropping that while at Princeton working under uh, Wigner, he was at Einstein's 70th birthday. Oh, party. fun. Yeah. That's interesting. Ed was at the party. I wish there were pictures of that. There might be at Princeton. Yeah, that would be interesting to find. So when we look at things like the um, incentives in what we're calling postmodern science, which is science that isn't you can't replicate or isn't working. The tools of validation don't really seem to hold up, meaning peer review is not doing a job of validation. P-values are easy to manipulate. Confidence intervals aren't really showing what they can be. And I'm interested to hear from you what science is broken and what science is working. It seems to me that uh, a fair amount of uh, the non-replicability problem is in the biological sciences. Now, I'm not a biomedic, so I can't talk about uh, what they are actually looking at, but I can certainly talk about the statistical methodology in those. And I think that uh, they need to use Bayesian probabilistic methods, and they need to throw out methods in particular like meta-analysis, 
which came into uh, the biological sciences from the social sciences and which just look at a whole load of different experiments and a, lift, and a whole load of different papers and put them all together. And you should be able to get a better result by, in principle by doing that. But the mathematical techniques of, of meta-analysis, which are used today, seem to me to uh, be far from accurate, far from correct. That's one reason why uh, there might be a replicability problem in the biological sciences. Another is quite simply that uh, you're not using enough data. The data sets aren't big enough. They need to be bigger still. And so what science is working? I think that uh, a certain amount of uh, physics is it by and large in a fairly healthy state, but that's because it's more mathematical, not because physicists are brighter than uh, biologists. I held that rather patronising view early on in my research career, but I now completely respect the biological sciences. I think what's going on there in the era of molecular biology is wonderful research. And so why is it working in physics because of the math? Because it's just more rigorous? Is that the assumption? There are fewer extraneous variables uh, and they're easier to eliminate. I mean, in the biological sciences, if you're doing control experiments with human beings, you can't lock them up and starve them for a month to see what happens, for example. Anymore. I think we did do that for a little while, Lancel Keys. <laughs> but I think the only other real sort of and maybe this is a little projecting or putting you in a hot seat, but when we look at the science that's broken or we look at the manipulation of these statistical tools, how is that dangerous for society? It depends what the interface between the uh, science and human beings is. If you are looking at non-replicability in, say, uh, drug test outcomes, that is very important because of for obvious reasons. You don't want to be giving people junk drugs that have bad side effects, but which don't which actually deal with the problem for which it's being prescribed. That's one example. Another example is climate science, where whatever is or isn't going on uh, in regard to the greenhouse effect in the upper atmosphere. One school of thought as to what is, quote, the master knob on the dial has grabbed all the grants, and that's the carbon dioxide school of thought. I have doubts about that. It's not exactly my field of science, uh, but I very strongly regret that one of the competing schools of thought has grabbed all the grants and has grabbed all the airspace. So that's an example of consensus dictating the future of research. Exactly, yes. And why is that dangerous? Because they might be wrong if there are several schools of thought and it's absolutely at the research frontier where we don't know who's correct. So it's the diversity of opinions that we're lacking that will lead to research projects that will never happen. Yes, or that will not happen for a generation. And if that is something that has uh, political consequences, then it will have dire consequences for society. There are many of these uh, arguments that take place within physics or biology where they don't make any difference to you and me. It's just an argument inside the universities. Things like climate change do, obviously, and drugs. Great, thank you so much. It's a pleasure.